John and Marin Huntvet migrated from Norway in 1868 to the Isles of Shoals, a cluster of nine small islands off the coasts of both Maine and New Hampshire, to live the so-called American Dream. One of the isles, Smuttinos Island, was named by a group of local fishermen who saw the island from afar and noticed how the seaweed at one end looked like the smutty nose of a massive sea creature. The remote island captured the Huntfits' imaginations and they decided to move there into a big red house, the couple being the sole residents of the tiny island. John Christian Huntfit was born in February 1842 in Stoke, Norway, and was the only child born to Christian Hergensen and Karen Marie Christopher's daughter. His wife, Marin, was born Marin Sabiel Christensen and was born in November 1835 to parents Christian Gundersen and Edel Heinrich's daughter in Hedrum, Norway. She was their only child, though she had two younger half-brothers through her father, Gunder and Ivan, also known as Ivan. The couple soon adapted to their newfound life on the remote island, with a new daily routine in place. John would take his schooner sailing vessel, the Clarabella, to the local fishing ground before taking his catch to Portsmouth to sell at market, leaving his wife, Marin, and their dog, Ringa, back on Smutty Nose. Following this, John, who was noted as being a persevering and industrious man who had a lot of respect amongst his Shoal Isle peers, would stock up on bait and then sail home to Smutty Nose Island sometime in the late afternoon. This routine became somewhat ritualistic for him. John's business prospered, and as a result, he and Marin lived a comfortable and peaceful life, though naturally they missed their loved ones back in Norway. In May of 1871, Marin's sister, Karen Christensen, visited the island from Norway, following the tragic loss of her partner. Marin helped support her sister through her grief, and in doing so, Christensen decided to join her sister on the Isles, eventually gaining employment as a maid for a family on one of the other Shoal Isles, Appledore, and later being offered a seamstress position in Boston. During the following year, John's business continued to prosper, and in 1872 he hired a young, muscular Prussian man named Louis Wagner. Louis was also a fisherman by trade, and over the years became friendly with the Huntfits, despite having a mysterious and lone wolf-like persona. According to those who knew him, though not very well, Louis very much kept himself to himself and rarely spoke about himself or his past. Many viewed Louis as a bit of a lurker, hiding around corners and listening to people's conversations. Despite this, however, Louis developed a friendship with John and Marin and became very close to the couple. After being hired by John to help out with his fishing endeavours, Louis was given room and board at the Hunfit's home in exchange for his efforts, but by October, John realised he didn't need as much help as he had initially thought. His brother Matthew and Marin's brother Ivan and his wife Anathy decided to visit from their homeland of Norway. Ivan and Matthew very much helped make John's business a family one by assisting him whenever he needed it. Meanwhile, Anathy helped Marin look after the house and the family dog, who tended to have free roam of the island. 
Following the arrivals of Matthew, Ivan and Anathe, 28-year-old Louis Wagner continued to board at the Hundvets' home for another five weeks, before deciding to leave the Isles for good, boarding the Addison Gilbert Schooner in November, but things didn't quite go as planned. Louis's boat wrecked and, with very little money to his name, was forced to work a poorly paid job along Portsmouth Pier. Unable to afford his own abode, Louis stayed with a family by the name of Jonsen, though he ended up being in arrears with his rent. Following a harsh and brutal winter season, spring was finally upon the residents of the Shoal Isles, and on March 6th, 1873, John, Matthew and Ivan set sail on the Clarabella trawler, which was normally docked in the cove, under the bright sunshine, planning to catch some fish, sell it at market and collect some fresh bait as usual, which was to arrive on an early train from Boston, should all things go to plan. Normally, one of the men would be taken back to Smutty Nose before heading on to the mainland, but due to the calm weather conditions, they decided to continue on. During their voyage, the three men ran into a neighbour and asked them to return to the island to inform Marin, Karen and Anathe that the trio would return later that night and not to worry. The neighbour informed the three women later that afternoon, who at this time had already prepared some supper, though they decided to keep it warm and wait for the men to return before eating. When the Clarabella docked in Portsmouth in early evening, Louis was at the pier and helped use mooring ropes to secure the boats to the dock. He asked John, Matthew and Ivan if they would be returning home that evening, following which John explained that they would return to the island if the bait arrived on time, but if for whatever reason it was late, the trio would stay at port and return home the following morning. John then asked his old friend, Louis, to help bait the fishing lines, to which Louis agreed, though he did already have plans in place that night. Baiting the lines would have taken many hours, though it was reported that Louis was seen around 7.30pm in Portsmouth itself. Through street whispers, Louis learned that the train carrying the fish bait did not arrive on time, and knowing John was saving money for a new boat, he decided to seize the opportunity to burgle the Huntvet's home, whilst the three men stayed at port. Meanwhile, at approximately 10pm, Marin, Karen and Anathe decided to eat their dinner without the men, before changing for bed and turning in for the night. Marin made a bed for her sister in the kitchen near the stove, before she and Anathe went to the bedroom adjacent, so that they could all keep warm nearer the fireplace. It was a bitterly cold night, where a sprinkling of snow had powdered the island. Meanwhile, Louis scoured the Piscataqua River, where he stole a small rowing boat from Pickering Wharf before sailing 12 miles to the Isles of Shoals. It was a long and tiresome trip, under a veil of snow-drizzled darkness, but Louis's determination to carry out the robbery helped drive him to reach shore. He avoided the cove where the Clarabella normally docked and rowed towards the far end of Smutty Nose Island, where he abandoned the boat on the rocky shore. He subsequently hid in amongst thickets of wild rose and bayberries and watched the Huntfit's cottage for hours before the candlelight in the windows eventually dwindled. Now believing that the women were asleep, Louis crept up to the house and opened the door, with ease, the latch being unbolted, presumably for when the men came home. Louis quietly closed the door behind him before placing a small piece of kindling into the latch of the bedroom door, where Marin and Anathe slept. Just at this moment, the family dog, Ringa, woke up and began to bark, trying to ward off the intruder. 
As a result, Karen awoke and saw Louis's dark figure standing by the window, though she assumed it was John, back from the mainland. Marin then awoke to see what was going on, before her sister replied that John had scared her, still being half asleep at this time, having not realised it was not, in fact, her brother-in-law. Panicked, Louis grabbed a nearby chair and struck Karen across the head, Marin hearing the commotion and trying to exit her bedroom, only to realise the door was jammed shut. Louis continued to attack Karen, but in doing so, he threw her against the bedroom door and unlatched it, falling at her sister's feet. In a rage, Louis hit both women, though Marin tried to protect her sister from him and slammed the door shut with all her might. Anafe was watching the horrific events unfold from the corner of the bedroom before Marin demanded she escape. Anathy climbed out of the bedroom window before landing barefoot in the snow. She was terrified and didn't know what to do. Marin continued to yell at her to run, but it was too late. By this point, Louis had left the cottage and approached Anathy with an axe, which had been leaning by the front door to chop ice. He then struck her with the hatchet, Anathy suddenly falling to the ground, dead. Marin looked on, completely shocked. She couldn't fathom how a man she once considered to be a friend could be such a monster. Anathy's body lay lifeless as Louis continued to batter her, Marin continuing to watch on, frozen in terror, but she knew she had to protect herself and her sister. She told Karen to run, but she was too terrified and appeared somewhat faint. Louis then re-entered the house and walked towards the bedroom door with the bloody axe in his hand. Marin then jumped out of the window with her dog in tow, running barefoot in the snow towards the cove to look for Louis's boat to escape on, but it was not there. She ran towards the far end of the island before hiding between two large rocks near to the water's edge, holding her breath in the hopes that Louis wouldn't find her. Meanwhile, back at the Huntvet's cottage, Karen was trying to escape through the bedroom window when Louis managed to burst into the room, swinging his axe violently at her, but he missed, breaking the wooden axe handle in the process. Following his failed attempts to strike her, Louis removed his handkerchief from his pocket and twisted it around Karen's throat, strangling her to death. For the remainder of the night, Louis searched the island for Marin, determined to silence her. But as the morning began to approach, Louis decided to abandon his hunt for her, in order to escape before the sun rose up. He returned to the ransacked cottage, ate some food he brought with him and drank some tea, before taking a mere $15 worth of goods from the cottage before fleeing the scene. It was approximately 8am the following morning when Marin decided it was safe for her to come out of hiding, waving down some children playing nearby for assistance. After the children alerted a neighbour, a man by the name of Jorge Engerbretsen, who was from the nearby island of Appledore, rode to Smutty Nose to rescue Marin, before bringing her back to his home to be comforted by his wife. Meanwhile, Engerbretsen gathered local men to hunt for Louis Wagner on Smutty Nose Island, and it was only then they discovered the horrific deeds he had carried out. Later that day, the Clarabella began its sail home until John, Matthew and Ivan noticed a signal from the shore of Appledore. Matthew and Ivan rode to the island where they visited the Ingerbredsen home, where they found a very shaken Marin who recounted the horrors she faced the night prior. 
As Ivan and Matthew returned to Smutty Knowles to search for Anathy, John arrived home where he discovered Karen and Anathy's mutilated bodies. Ivan and Matthew arrived on the island soon after, with Ivan collapsing in the snow after seeing his wife lying in a pool of dried blood. Devastated and traumatised, not to mention baffled by the motive behind this sickening crime, the trio reported their findings to the New Hampshire police, where a description of Louis Wagner was telegraphed to various police detachments across the state and printed in numerous newspapers in the hopes that they would catch him. As a result, news of the murders spread like wildfire, the locals in utter disbelief that such a horrendous crime would be committed so close to home. As a result of their investigations, police questioned two men, both of whom knew Louis, who informed authorities that they had seen him in Newcastle at approximately 6am that morning. The rowing boat that Louis had stolen was also found by the quay. Investigations determined that Louis had caught the 9am train to Boston, and that evening Boston police apprehended the fugitive, who did not resist arrest. Wagner was then transferred by train from Newcastle to Portsmouth Jail, during which time he was met with furious citizens holding fire torches and chucking stones who wanted him dead for what he had done. According to some sources, thousands of people lined the streets just to catch a glimpse of the murderer. Louis Wagner was put on trial on June 9th, 1873, where after nine days of testimonies, he was found guilty and charged with the murders of Karen Christensen and her sister-in-law, Anathy Christensen. His story was jumbled, and he couldn't recall an accurate timeline of his movements on the night of the murders. He claimed to be baiting trawls for a fishing boat, though he could not remember the name of the boat, the captain or where the vessel was docked. He also claimed to have fallen asleep outside a saloon after drinking some beer, but once again he could not recall the name of the tavern or where it was located. The evidence against him, however, was strong. He had hidden a bloody shirt at the boarding house he had been staying at. Some cash was found in his pockets upon his arrest, which had been stolen from the Huntfit's home, and a button was found in amongst the coins, which belonged to Marin. Marin's own witness testimony recounted Anathe's heart-wrenching final words, seemingly confirming the identity of her killer. Louis, Louis, Louis. Within a few days of his conviction, Louis managed to escape from Alfred Prison in the middle of the night after picking the cell lock with a wooden toothbrush before stuffing his bed with various items to make it appear as if he was asleep under the sheets. Following his escape, Louis bought new clothes, cut his hair and shaved his beard, but he was still recognised and subsequently recaptured in New Hampshire. He was then transferred to a prison in Maine due to Smutty Nose Island and the Northern Isles of the Shoals being in Maine's jurisdiction, rather than the Southern Islands which were in New Hampshire's. On June 25th, 1875, Louis faced the gallows and was hanged at the state prison in Thomaston, Maine, though he proclaimed his innocence until his final breath. Following the tragic deaths of Karen and Anathy, John and Marin Huntfit moved away from Smutty Nose to Portsmouth, where John continued his fishing business. They had a daughter, Clara, who was born four years after the murders, and they eventually moved back to Norway. However, John and Clara later returned to the US, where John remarried and had another child, a son, John Christian, in 1891. 
Neither the Huntfit nor Ivan Christensen could bear to live at the cottage where they had so many happy memories with 40-year-old Karen and 30-year-old Anathy, memories which were destroyed following the murders. Ivan worked as a carpenter on the Isle of Appledore for the remainder of the summer before returning to his native Norway. Tragically, rumour has it that Ivan Christensen was never seen or heard from again.